Now let's look at some of the strategic options in response to these master narratives and how we've elucidated them across those eight stages. We're going to focus on two key players, uh, the United States and Japan, and then make some arguments about others. For the United States, one strategic option that we would highlight, be careful what you wish for. That's the notion of if China gets old before it gets fast and turns aggressive, that's going to be a fairly desperate China and we could find ourselves, the United States, in some of the same dynamic conundrums that we did with Japan in the 1930s and obviously seeking to avoid that level of conflict in a nuclear world. A second strategic option, watch the triumphalism. Okay? When China hits that wall and starts to slow down and finds itself in the pathway of a, uh, a modern Japan, that's going to be quite a blow to its confidence and its sense of belief in itself in the future. And at that point, uh, when the United States is probably on the rebound, uh, it'll be very uh, important for Washington to avoid uh, a resumption of triumphalism like it had in the uh, post-Cold War period. Third strategic option, more to the Kaiserian Germany situation, be prepared to out China, China in influence markets. Not just Latin America, not just the Middle East, Africa too. And then in terms of the most positive scenario, if China does move positively towards democratization and achieves escape velocity, America, for its own competitive sake, needs to focus on its development, needs to focus on its infrastructure, needs to put itself in the best possible competitive space to deal with that very impressive and very competitive China. Now let's look at Japan. If Japan was facing a rerun of itself in its new very important trade partner, then our argument is it has to be careful not to tether itself so much to China's economy that it suffers another lost dynamic, uh, lost decade dynamic. If China is moving towards the pathway of being more like in an imperial Japan pre-World War II, then Japan's going to have to consider a military buildup of a nature uh, that uh, forces it to change its constitutional limits on defense spending. If we're looking more at the pre-World uh, World War I scenario, then uh, China, we would argue, needs uh, 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 to be told in uh, no uncertain terms that when the North Korean rehab project finally comes doable, uh, uh, in terms of due, in terms of payment, that J J Japan and South Korea and the United States should make fairly clear that because of China's special relationship with North Korea all these years, it's really uh, China's problem to pay for, not South Korea, not Japan, not the United States. And finally, if China achieves sort of the South Korean pathway, uh, uh, we argue that uh, it's going to be a tumultuous one, and as it does so, uh, Japan needs to be ready in terms of its own strategic planning and thinking about a China that possibly fragments and becomes more than one country in its successful evolution towards democratization. Some other countries and strategic options we'd like to briefly highlight. In terms of Russia, obviously they have some uh, opportunity to take advantage if China slows down and becomes less uh, active in Central Asia, but we also think it should offer from its own perspective um, uh, as, as much uh, um, validating alliance, uh, friendship to a fellow a single party dictatorship as it can because those are becoming fewer and fewer in this world and uh, China offers uh, Russia to the extent it holds off democratization a very validating alliance partner as well. In terms of the EU, uh, we think it should try to beat out Japan for any mentoring role on the subject of rapid aging uh, with China, uh, and it should uh, contrast itself with the uh, too young America, because America will not age at nearly the pace China does. They're roughly the same age now in terms of uh, mean age, but China by mid-century is going to be in its late 40s. America will be about 40 years old. This gives the Europeans an interesting opportunity, again, to play a mentoring role and perhaps do so more so than a Japan, which is truly inward looking. In terms of the Indians, uh, we think it, uh, they need to be ready for their eclipsing moment and they need to handle that moment when they start to be perceived as the new rising economic power with as much maturity as possible because the handoff will be coming from China itself and to the extent that the Indians make the Chinese nervous as they surpass China and that demographic dividend and their capacity for manufacturing, 
there we risk some real rivalry. Uh, same arguments for Brazil. They're going to step forward in terms of uh, more role in the global economy, uh, and there's going to be some natural rivalry with China on that score. In terms of Pakistan, obvious argument, you need to hedge against having too many of your eggs in the one patron's basket, i.e. China. So they need to broaden their alliances, so to speak. In terms of the ASEAN countries, uh, they need to learn Chinese low-end manufacturing, but in a way that fosters regional economic uh, integration and doesn't create negative dynamics with the Chinese. In terms of Taiwan, it needs to wage its own aggressive soft power campaign across the mainland because it needs to anticipate and encourage the ultimate democratization lifting point or inflection point that China eventually will reach. In terms of the global jihadist movement, Al-Qaeda, uh, there is a strong temptation, and we see this already, push for jihad in the Uyghur West. Uh, but at some point, in, uh, if they do that and get successful at it, they risk encouraging a Sino-American alliance uh, on that particular subject. So what they want to do is uh, kind of pursue their global jihad to the point of destabilizing, angering, creating the right responses from China, but not so much that it creates strong alliance between the Americans and the Chinese. In terms of Saudi Arabia, one strategic option that we uh, posited in this simulation uh, seek to deliver Iraq as Iran's replacement on oil and on that basis kind of divorce Iran from China in terms of long-term strategic interests. And then in terms of Mongolia, we say it should sell itself over time as a long-term investment sanctuary for Chinese savers uh, because as China slows down, uh, necessarily the Mongolian economy, which is highly dependent on resource extraction going in the direction of China, it will also slow down. In terms of North Korea, it should realize that the clock is ticking on China's aid and it should prepare itself for a possible sellout strategy to South Korea at the right moment. In terms of Singapore, it needs to move in the direction of encouraging uh, and enabling uh, India's own rise and playing the same role as third party foreign direct invest, uh, investment conduit to India as it did with China previously. So it needs to switch its focus in terms of FDI flows. In terms of Malaysia, uh, which has already over time historically received a lot of Chinese immigrants, they should be prepared for even more in the future. In terms of Vietnam, they should prep their own infrastructure in terms of port development, uh, and they should improve their investment uh, environment so they can capture as much as possible, and this is a generic advice for really all of Southeast Asia, uh, the necessary outflow of low-end manufacturing jobs from China uh, as part of Southeast Asia's rise through a demographic dividend. And then finally, uh, this is a flag you probably don't recognize, it's the one for Interpol. Uh, we should expect uh, Chinese-based uh, global criminal networks to flourish during any slowdown. Finally, some bottom lines from this uh, simulation. Uh, generally, we believe there's too much attention given to China's rise and the so-called Chinese century. We don't see enough attention being given to its inevitable slowdown, because we think the more important strategic conundrums are found there. So when the Pentagon plans on China's uninterrupted rise, we think they're making a mistake. We think they need to plan more for China in a desperation mode as things begin to slow down, and they don't find themselves dominating uh, to the degree they had expected for quite some time. So if you think the fear threat reaction in Washington, D.C. right now, when there's this perception that China's surpassing America, if you think that's a scary response, uh, it's going to be much worse when the reverse is true, when China slows down, when America naturally rebounds, and we see the tables turned on this sense of who's rising, who's falling, uh, we expect in the 2020s. So we uh, expect America to go a little bit overboard with the renewed triumphalism. That's the nature of the American society. We think we need to build, uh, the United States needs to build as much as possible strong, positive relationships with the Chinese in the meantime to avoid that potentially destabilizing situation, which we think inevitably arrives uh, again sometime in the 2020s. And finally, we would argue that China's slowdown will be the most important geostrategic process of the first half of the 20th century. So more study absolutely required. If you have more questions, if you'd like to see the written report based on this simulation, please contact us at wikistrat.com. I thank you for your time and attention.